Here's another condition that's not strictly speaking an intersex condition, cloacal extrophy where the pelvis doesn't develop normally. Half of these people are XY uh, males, but because of John Money, they were made to look female. They were immediately castrated at birth and uh, lied to and raised as girls and subjected to lots of surgeries and hormone treatments and so forth. And then finally, after decades, a guy by the name of Reiner decides to go study them and see what, turn, what, what happened to these genetic males that were raised as females. And it turns out that more than half, on their own, without knowing they were lied to, knowing anything, spontaneously, on their own, decided they're going to live as men. Uh, and for the, those who did not, well, Milton Diamond would say, maybe they're just coping. Or maybe one or two of them are like a friend of mine who, had cloacal, who has cloacal extrophy. Managed, the mother said she wanted a son, so they kept the testes. But this individual grew up without ever going through puberty because those testes never made androgen. And you can tell by looking at that beautiful skin and, uh, and so on. And uh, uh, this individual really has the identity of a female. So Anthony is really Kayla. And again, the exception proves the rule here. You cannot guess about somebody's sexual identity. You have to let them figure out who they are. You can't do that at birth. There's no way. All right, well, I'm going to tell you about the sexual brain. The amygdala, which is part of the limbic system, is where all your emotion comes from. And it's, the limbic system is, uh, reaches its pinnacle development in all mammals, so it's uh, as well developed in a little mouse as it is in a human. And the hypothalamus is another ancient place in the brain that is linked up with this amygdala, this emotional part of the brain. And the hypothalamus, among other things, is a source of our instinctive drives and behaviors. Now, I want to ask you, what gets you up in the morning? And what makes you do anything that you do? Feelings and drives. Feelings and drives, gang. I mean, there's a reason why the emotional brain had to evolve before the neocortex, because otherwise we wouldn't care enough to even use the neocortex. Okay. So, uh, and, and uh, the hypothalamus is the place that drives you. So when you're hungry, that's your hypothalamus talking to you. It's regulating your food intake. When you're thirsty, that's your hypothalamus talking to you. When you're sleepy, that's your hypothalamus talking to you. All your body rhythms are timed by your hypothalamus, and your sexuality is being driven by your hypothalamus. You are not in charge of your hypothalamus. It's in charge of you. OK. And all kinds of experiments on animals have shown that there's really two places in the hypothalamus that have to do with sexuality. This red place has to do with making hormones and governing the activity of the pituitary gland, which is attached to the hypothalamus by a, a, a stalk. And this pituitary gland, its hormones in turn, control the gonads and other glands in your body. But what I'm interested in right now is this blue area, because this blue area controls sexual behavior. And this is the anterior, the front part of the hypothalamus, which looks very much the same in all mammals. And here we're looking at a cross-section through that anterior hypothalamus where the dark things are called nuclei. And a nucleus is gray matter. It's where neurons come together in synapse. And some of these neurons, uh, some of these nuclei, rather, have been found to be sexually dimorphic. That is, they're different sizes in typical males versus typical females. And that's a clue. You know, that's a clue. Oh, this must have something to do with sexuality because these nuclei look different in males versus females. So now I want to tell you about the brain work. And we'll start with sexual orientation. And there's a lot of evidence to indicate that gay people are just as natural as everybody else. You can go to almost any culture and you'll find gay people. They might be very hidden. You might have to look. But if you look, you'll find them. And now we realize that same-sex behavior is rampant in the animal kingdom. Okay, So that should tell you something. Did these birds choose to be gay, do you think? Or did they learn that someplace? I don't think so. <laughs> well, let me just ask you, I mean, this is common sense. Did you ever have a, a, a puppy or a kitten? Did you have to teach that animal its sexuality? Or didn't it just sort of all by itself kind of figure it out? And if that animal behaves differently than you expected it to, is it because the animal learned that? Or is it because that's just the way that animal is? I mean, I think we always knew that sexuality is, is something that's sort of programmed into the animal. They're not choosing that. Well, anyway, Simon LeVay, back in 1991, decided to look at the anterior hypothalamus of gay men. Based on all the animal work, let's go look at this part of the brain in gay people. And so he did. And uh, here we see the data on the four kinds of nuclei found in this region. And only one of them showed a difference. That's the interstitial, interstitial nucleus of the anterior hypothalamus, the third one. Okay? Here we see 
the size of the female nucleus. Here's the size of the male nucleus, much bigger in typical males. And in homosexual males, you notice the size is the same as it is in typical females. So this was uh, uh, evidence that there's a difference in the brain here in the anterior hypothalamus that's uh, causing these gay men to be androphilic, uh, attracted to men the same way typical women are. <clears throat> Then this study was repeated by somebody who didn't believe LeVay, a guy by the name of Hines, and he wound up confirming LeVay's findings. But he used a different endpoint, and so he found some additional information, and that is while the volume of this nucleus might be the same size in, in gay men and typical women, the number of cells in the nucleus, uh, uh, which represents the number of cell bodies in that nucleus, the volume is the nerve endings coming in, nerves, nerve cells making s connections with it. But the, the cell number was the same in uh, gay men and straight men. So just keep that in the back of your head. All right, now then it turns out uh, that sheep are notoriously gay. And some animal scientists at a university, they actually knew which sheep are gay and which are not. So when the animals were sacrificed, they got those brains and they looked at them. And guess what they did? They looked at that anterior hypothalamus, the same region that LeVay looked at in humans. And guess what they found? They found exactly what LeVay found. So do you think those gay sheep chose to be gay? Sorry. I think that's very compelling. And when we uh, give people sex pheromones to sniff, you know, this anterior hypothalamus lights up. If, oh dear, I'm getting a 10 minute sign. Oh. Uh, if you smell bacon, it doesn't light up. <clears throat> and there is evidence for uh, uh, gay genes. I, I'm not gonna go into detail because I don't have the time. There is evidence for uh, gay genes and lesbianism as well. What about sexual identity? All right, here we have a nucleus uh, that's also in the anterior hypothalamus called the bed nucleus of the stria terminalis. This is Dick Schwab's work in the Netherlands. Uh, back in 95, when I saw this paper, it blew me out of the water. This uh, is a nucleus that is um, the connection between uh, neurons coming from the amygdala, so this is emotional information, coming into the anterior hypothalamus for sexual behavior. Okay, so this is the link between emotion and sexual behavior. And the amygdala, by the way, does get input about sex hormones, sex pheromones. Anyway, uh, here we have a typical male. Here we have a typical female. This is a gay guy, and ignore the uh, streaks, those are artifacts. Notice that this nucleus looks the same in the gay man and the straight man, and this is a trans woman. This is a male to female person, indistinguishable from a typical woman, okay? Now we know this area of the brain is responsible for sexual behaviors or destroy it. The animal has no sexual behavior, and so this is indicating that there's a place in the brain that has something to do with sexual behavior, that appears to have something to do with sexual identity, and that male to female people, this part of the brain looks the same as it does in typical women. And if I had more time, I could explain more, but uh, these researchers did a great job. They put in people with all kinds of uh, endocrine disorders to show that changes in estrogen or androgen levels in adulthood do not change the size of these nuclei. The implication being that these nuclei have been the way they are since birth, organization activation mechanism. This study was then repeated using a second endpoint. The first one was looking at the nerve fibers coming in from the amygdala. The second one is looking at the uh, uh, VIP, the, the neurotransmitter made by the cells that the incoming neurons are synapsing with. Uh, so these are the postsynaptic neurons. And guess what? Find the same thing. This is a straight guy, typical woman, gay guy, trans woman. Can you tell the difference? See, they look the same. So this is telling me that transsexual people are not crazy. They're not crazy. They really do have a female identity. Or trans women do. They're not making this up. They're not lying. They're not imagining. They're not hallucinating. It's real. That the anatomy, and there's all kinds of studies I don't have time to tell you about, and, and the physiology of their brains is such that it's consistent with their felt identity. Okay? Uh, oh, and who's missing in the story? We have straight, men, uh, straight guys, and we have uh, typical women, and we have male to female. Who's missing? Female to male? Huh? 
in this second study, one precious brain, one, the only one we've had a chance to look at in this way, is a female to male individual. And there he is right in there with all the other guys. Look at the size of this nucleus, the same as all the regular guys. Very compelling. Oh, and over here, S7. S7 is somebody who died in their late 70s, never had any hormones, never had any uh, uh, sex uh, surgery or anything, and yet this individual, a male-bodied individual, always felt female, always, from the earliest memories, always, and yet had no treatment. And look at that nucleus in S7, the same as all the other females. Then uh, it looked uh, at that interstitial nucleus that, I, that Simon LeVay looked at. They looked at it again. Looked, remember I said the cell number was the same in gay men and straight men? Because it, it turns out they found when they looked at the trans people that the cell number has to do with sexual identity. So the cell number has to do with sexual identity, the volume with sexual orientation. You would expect somewhere in the brain that identity and orientation would somehow come together, and that seems to be happening in the third interstitial nucleus. And yes, their anterior hypothalamus responds differently to pheromones in trans people, showing that their brains are different. And yes, there's evidence for genetics uh, for transsexuality. For example, uh, male to female people have a longer version of this antigen receptor, which this red thing represents more. And that is thought to keep this receptor from working in the brain cells. So these people, the antigen works everywhere except in the part of the brain that uh, uh, for sexual identity, and that's why they have male bodies, but a female identity. Hmm. And then the female to male people also, there's a high proportion with a gene variant that codes for this enzyme, and this enzyme now is more efficient than usual, so these people make more testosterone than other people would, and this is thought to be possibly the reason for these female body people having male identities. 